Yes. But, uh, does it work? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so I will continue on um, Dyson Schwinger equation, and please, again, uh, do not hesitate to ask questions. Uh, my plan is, as I said, to tell you about five applications of uh, Dyson Schwinger equation, by, with the idea that by repeating the same techniques five times at the end, you will understand it. But maybe it doesn't work like this, and you prefer to understand one better, and so you should just ask questions. I will go more slowly, and maybe I will do one application less. Okay. So today what I want to discuss is the, the generalization of what I told you about yesterday to matrix model in a perturbative setting. So we consider uh, the following uh, probability measure. So I will take several matrices. It will be the only uh, result with several matrices, which is connected with the last talk yesterday. So you look at one of uh, Z and Z, and then you have exponential of minus N, the trace of B in X1 N, X M N. Okay, and so this is uh, the notation that uh, Sasha also used. So it's a Lebesgue measure on emission matrices. Okay, so V is going to be a polynomial. And we will think about it as the Gaussian, uh, independent Gaussian matrices. Plus a small polynomial, small interacting polynomial. Okay. And um, so the point is that you want this polynomial to be uh, self-adjoint. Okay, so V is V star. So if you plug self-adjoint variable in V, then you get a self-adjoint matrix. So that this is real. That's the important point. You, don't, you want to deal with probability measures. And uh, what I will assume is I, I, I need to have uh, V going to infinity well enough. And in fact, I, I, I assume even more. I want that the trace of uh, V is uh, strictly con convex. So the addition of the trace of V is bounded below by C times identity. Okay, so, so I, I, uh, I take, so what I mean is the, a sum, uh, I don't know, alpha I1 IP, so this are uh, complex, eventually, XI1 XIP. Yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, yeah, a classical polynomial with complex entries, but the whole thing is self-adjoint. Uh, you would have liked this to be matrices or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, I mean, it's just, uh, okay, so I could add, okay, I could add fixed matrices which would come into these worlds. This is what you mean to say, like, what you did, but this is doable. This is doable, uh, so you could have did uh, an extra family uh, of, uh, of matrices. But then the answer will be even more complicated because it will depend on the joint law of these guys. And again, the, this would have to come here. So, okay, and so the, um, so not, not today, but this is, this is doable. Uh, okay, and so the, the theorem uh, want to say is that, uh, so if C is positive, 
positive uh, for all k, which is an integral number. We can find epsilon, which depends on c and k, positive. So that's somehow um, what we proved yesterday, which was the expansion in the dimension of the expectation of the trace, is going to, to expand in n up to order 2k. So this means that so the expectation under PNV of one over n, the trace, let's say of a word, xi1, xi uh, m, okay, so xi k. So here this or just integer between one and m. So this will expand, so it will be some p equal zero to uh, k, one over n to the two p, and times something that I will not to p of x i one i k, so it depends on epsilon, plus small o of one over n to the 2k. Uh, yeah. And also, uh, you look, for instance, at the uh, free energy. So the partition function is here. It's a normalizing constant for this probability measure. So you have also the same type of uh, expansion. Okay, and then, uh, so a bonus is, uh, is that you have an uh, expression for this, so the uh, analytic function in uh, epsilon. So, so epsilon of xi1, so maybe I should, actually I should have put g, it would have been more... Uh, xi1, xi... Uh, K is uh, the sum of, uh, uh, okay, so, yeah, so this is this, or the product, so maybe I, I should just uh, write it in short, the sum of alpha Q times Q, so Q are just monomials, so this will be the product minus epsilon, alpha Q, KQ, factorial, and then you put MG of uh, the one XI1, XIK, uh, KQ, Q. Okay, and so uh, what are these numbers? So it's uh, like uh, yesterday. So if I have a fa family of, of uh, let's say, uh, P, I have P times of monomials. So this is going to be an integer number, which is going to count maps, okay? So uh, to, to define it, uh, I need first to associate to a monomial or vertex. Okay, so maybe I should go over there because I am going to go in the dark corner otherwise. So to, to a monomial a Q, which is let's say Xi1, Xip, uh, you associate a star what we call a star of type Q. Q. So it's a vertex with colored half edges, which depends on your letters here. So it's rooted. So the first half edge has color I1, so it's a root. The second has color I2. The third has color I3, I4, I5 and so on until IP. Okay, so it's a, you can think about it as a vertex of degree P, but with half edges which are colored depending on which letter. 
you have one after the other. Okay, so if you have only one letter, it's just a vertex of valence P. Okay, and then, uh, so M, G, Q1, Q1, uh, QP, QP. So that's the number of maps. So remember that maps are connected graphs that you can draw on the surface, so it's of genus G. Uh, which is built on uh, Ki stars of type uh, Qi. Okay, so for instance, let me imagine that you have, I don't know, Q, that you have only two colors, and you have Q which is x1, x2, x1, x2. Uh, Q prime, Q1, and Q2, X1 to the fourth, three, which is X2 to the four. Uh, then uh, what you see is that so this uh, this one will correspond to this type of vertices. And this one will correspond to just, ah, that's a red which is not very red. Okay. <laughs> Let's see, what about the green? Okay, yeah, I don't know. Okay, so you have a, a white one and a, a, a green uh, red one. Okay, so you have these two type of vertices, so you, you draw them, so let's say I have three like this, and I have one like this, and uh, I don't know, two like this. Oops. And now what you want to do is to uh, match the vertices which have the same color, so that the total genus of the map is given by G. Okay, so you, it has to be connected, so I don't know, you have to do something like this. Okay, Oop. Okay, Oop. Ah, okay. And so you see I just did one matching, and uh, apparently this matching does not live on the, on the sphere because you have this uh, crossing, but uh, you can apparently uh, draw it on the torus. Okay, so this would be a genus one. No? Ah! I didn't see that one. Okay, that's... Uh, that's terrible. Let's uh, let's keep it genus one because otherwise I have to count the genus. <laughs> I mean, uh, with the other one, I, that could be genus two or genus one. I would have to, to count the number of faces. Or so. Okay, this is a genus one. <laughs> okay, and if I would have done uh, something, uh, I don't know what I could have done, but something different like this would have been a genus uh, zero. For instance, okay, so you imagine you're counting these numbers and this is, this is defined through the MG. All right, so some um, uh, comments on, uh, on this uh, theorem. Uh, first, um, on the literature, so it's, uh, so the literature, so it's this, uh, this type of expansion was uh, first proposed by uh, Toft and then in a physics paper by Brezin, uh, Parisi, Itzikson, and Gibert. So in a physics paper. And uh, in mathematics, there was a paper by uh, uh, Ercolani and Ken, McLaughlin, who is here. When you have only uh, one matrix, 
Uh, this case with several matrices, uh, it was uh, me and Mo uh, Edouard Morel Segala. And uh, the point is that on several matrices, actually, there are not so many results. That's much more difficult than the one matrix. So in this generality, we, we don't know how to have something which is not perturbative. So next time I will show you in one dimension, you can take epsilon large, but here we need epsilon small. So there are, all, there are uh, still one generalization, which is to take only convex. Well, we need convexity. Actually, we can take uh, epsilon large, but it's uh, only convex, and it's only the, uh, the limit, so k equal to zero. And this is a recent work by Jekyll and, and Dabrowski. And uh, there is also something which works better, only also for k equal to zero. It's when the interaction is a, a b interaction. In this case, uh, you can get uh, limits, uh, but uh, you cannot get full expansion like this. Okay. And uh, of course, when you can get the full expansion like this, you can easily also get the central limit theorem. Okay, so what I want to show you uh, today is how to prove this kind of uh, results. Uh, I will not do the several matrix on the board because it's just uh, more notations, but in the lecture notes it's done with several matrices. So I will keep with one matrix, which is a bit weird because tomorrow I will show you how to do it in a much more clever way with one matrix and more general way, but uh, at least I think it will give you all the ideas to, uh, to do the several matrix and you can uh, look at it in the notes. So the ideas are really like yesterday. We want to use these dyson tringer equations. Is there any question on the, on the result? I want. Ah, sorry. I didn't put it. So is it, I forgot that. No, this was some, something else. Yeah, sorry. So I'm just saying that, so if, if uh, the Asian is bounded below by C, C is positive, so you have a strictly uh, uh, convex uh, trace of V, then for all K, you can find epsilon C of K, it's going to zero with K. Uh, such that uh, if epsilon is smaller than this positive number, then you have the expansion. It's uh, the epsilon here. So, so the, the V has to be a small perturbation of uh, the Gaussian case. That's really the, the point. And uh, maybe actually a, a remark, which is that it's not very uh, uh, clear well, our, our uh, convex function of several uh, uh, matrices look. And so there is a, a lemma which, is, uh, which helps you to have, get some idea, which is um, that if you, if you take a, a function f, which is convex from R to R, Then uh, you can define f of a matrix, x, okay, so x in the set of Hermitian matrices, okay, and uh, trace of f, then this as a function of the entries of the matrix will be convex. Okay, so, so then this shows you that uh, if I take, so Q, so I need, for instance, uh, if, uh, if Q is convex, so this means the Asian is non-negative and I have this extra term, I get example. So I can take Q of X1, Sm to be any sum of a P L of X1, 
uh, sorry, sum of alpha L xi, where the alpha Li are real and the PL are convex. Okay, so I'm just saying if I take any of this kind of combination of convex function of linear function in my uh, in my in my matrices, this will be a uh, the trace of this guy will be convex. So my uh, this hypothesis will be uh, fulfilled. In general, somehow you want that the the potential Q is going to infinity in the right direction because of course if Q uh, was going to go to minus infinity then eventually the partition function would be infinite and the system wouldn't be well defined. So you, you need to have some, uh, some hypothesis and for instance this kind of example uh, are going to, to do it. Any other questions before I, uh, I go to the, to the proof? No? Okay, so, so the proof is to, to go to, uh, to use uh, these dyson Schwinger equations. And dyson Schwinger equation. Ah, yeah. Okay, and, and now that I said I will take m equal to one, the proof. But again, it's really only for a notational purpose. And uh, v, to simplify also, I will take it V to be symmetric. And then I, I'm going to write the dyson schwinger equations. And so this will be that, so if I look at the same kind of formula as yesterday, this will be the trace of x plus epsilon, so it's a derivative of q, times uh, xk minus 1, times the product of the yki. I remind you that yk was the trace of xk minus its expectation. I take the, the same expectation as yesterday, but I have this extra term, which is going to, to come into the game, and this will be the expectation. So the right-hand side is exactly as yesterday. It's a sum of um, the trace of x l 1 over n, trace of x k minus 2 minus l, and times the product of the y k i. Uh, plus uh, the expectation of um, so wh when you differentiate this guy, so it will be the sum i equal to p, and then I have uh, the one over n, the trace of x k minus plus k i minus two times the product of a j different from i of y k j. Okay, so if epsilon equal to zero, I have the same formula as yesterday. Uh, but today I have this extra term, and the, the proof is again by integration by parts. I'm not going to do it again. And the proof is from the fact that if you take I am not, not going to develop, but you can check this is uh, going to work. Differentiate this uh, times um, the product of the yki times the density. And you write that, and you take the sum of our ij then you will check that uh, you get exactly this, uh, this formula. Okay, so, so the problem here is that uh, 
We see we cannot do as yesterday because uh, our relation is not an inductive uh, relation anymore because here you have this uh, polynomial which have a higher degree. So you could say, okay, these, the, these polynomials here are still of, of lower degree, but you cannot create all polynomial by just multiplying by this. So, so you have to do something. And uh, so the, what we are going to do is to have, uh, so we are going to prove compactness and a concentration of measure, which was the first step yesterday, uh, by uh, some external results, which are uh, coercive inequality by functional inequalities. Inequalities based qualities, so based on the fact that the relation of trace V is bounded below. So these two results will just be due to this assumption, so which will be crucial, and which, which we cannot really uh, deduce from the equation now. And then we will solve uh, uh, asymptotically Uh, the equation, and then to solve this equation, it's uh, again a bit more uh, complicated as, than before, but we have to show that somehow we can invert, as we will see, what we, uh, some operator, so this is what is called the inversion of the master operator. So it's still mysterious, but uh, this is This is somehow the, the, the way that uh, we can do to, to solve the equations in all these uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, problems. Okay, so let's, uh, let's start, unless you have some, uh, some question. Oh. So how do we, um, so what are going to be this uh, functional analysis? So coercive inequalities. So that's a very, that's really a very nice results which are used a lot in probability uh, to say that as soon as you have a measure which uh, uh, have a density which is strictly log concave, somehow it looks like a Gaussian uh, measure in many ways. And these inequalities provide you quantitative estimates. So it's very useful. And so the first one is uh, due to uh, herbs. So we have the concentration, which says that so uh, if we look under P and V, and we take any function f of the entries, uh, minus its expectation, so the probability that this is greater than delta going to be bounded by exponential minus n c uh, delta square divided by what I will denote uh, yeah, grad f to 2. And here, uh, grad f to 2 is the sum of uh, the derivatives square, and you take the L infinity norm. Yeah, and that's, I could have taken any uh, probability measure whose uh, density, the log of the density as a relation which is bounded above by minus n times c. So remember, c was the lower bound on the trace of v, but then I multiply by n, I will get this result. So it's regardless of uh, any other assumption. And then I have brass camp lib inequalities. And what brush complete inequalities tell me is that if I take G to be convex, so again, convex function of the entries, then uh, the expectation of G of, of the entries that I recenter by uh, Mij, so Mij is the Xij under dpnv. So under dpnv, I can compare this expectation with the one under the Gaussian law. So 
it's also, also ex all the entries. But now what I have is n trace x squared and over 2. OK, so this is actually p, but of the Gaussian potential. That's absolutely uh, not easy, because you would say, well, it's easy, because here I just use the bond on the, on the upper uh, quantity. But the point is that you have the right renormalization. So this is, the right, this is really the probability measure of the Gaussian uh, case. OK, and this is very nice, because of course, as I said yesterday, when we have the Gaussian case, we know how to compute many things. So we can use a priori all these bonds from uh, the Gaussian uh, case. So now how, how are, you, are we going to use it in our context? So we are going to take our favorite trace. And what we want to, to prove the lemma that uh, if we look at the trace of x and k. So we want to show that this is bonded for, for independently on, of n. And actually, what we are going to prove is even when k goes to infinity, so by using result on the Gaussian case, so I think I'm going to take some bond like this. something like this. For all k, which is smaller than maybe something like square root of n. I just need something which is going to infinity fast enough. It could have been log n, but OK. And then the other thing that, so this is compactness. And then uh, what I'm going to do is to have concentration inequalities. For any choices, I can bound this by some uh, d, uh, d of sum of ki. Okay. So here, uh, I just, uh, I mean, if I would use only what we did yesterday, I would have some k finite. But for later on, I will use k going to infinity, and I, I will. Uh, abstractly take some result on the GUE, which is kind of well known. And so how do we deduce uh, this kind of, uh, of result from here? Well, uh, for, for the first result, we just take G to be uh, the trace of X to the 2K. Okay, and because of Klein's lemma, we know this is convex. Ah, yes. and. So here, here, here I simplified. I took, I assumed that V was symmetric. So this is where it's, it makes my life a bit easier that these terms disappear. Otherwise, I can do estimates, but it's take me some time. So, uh, so let me simplify my life. In the notes, I think I didn't simplify the, my life, so you can see how to do it. And uh, so if I do that, then what I deduce is that this trace of x to the 2k under dp and uh, nv is bounded by the same thing, but under the GUE. OK, on this, so by w what we saw yesterday, it's smaller than, actually, here I, I had the n. No, here I put the 1 over n. And now I can use uh, the result. So as I said, what we saw yesterday is that it's bounded. Actually, you can see also that it's not going too fast, even when k is going to infinity more slowly than n to the 2 third. So you can use this kind of result. And uh, so this is uh, Komlosh Fodi who proved that, or Stoshnikov. So you have many proof of this uh, kind of bond. Yeah, but so this is really for free once you have brush complete inequality. Uh, so for um, 
For the second one, uh, it's also more or less this. The only thing that we have to be a bit careful is uh, that our function are not going to be have a, uh, this norm which is bounded because we have polynomial functions. So they are going to go to infinity at infinity. However, because of this result, and this is why I need some improved thing, I, I know that my eigenvalues are not going to go too far. So in fact, I can, um, I can proceed by approximation to deduce this result. Okay, so just so the concentration. So you take first f, which is uh, c1, and you deduce, so you know, so you want to take your, uh, maybe g, which is c1, and you want to take f, your function of the entry is to be trace of g of x. Okay? Then uh, what you see is that, so you want to compute this quantity to know how your bond is going to, to go. And so if you compute the derivative of x i j, so you can see that this is going to be g prime x of g i. Okay, we saw that yesterday when we have a polynomial. And so you can imagine that if g is uh, just a general Lipschitz function, this kind of formula uh, generalize. Okay. So then uh, when you have this, so what you see that this thing is going to be the sum, the L infinity norm of the sum ij of g prime x square g i. And so here you, it's nice because you don't have a sum in this over uh, n squared term, but only over n. You can bound this by n g prime infinity square. All right, and then uh, when you plug this, uh, when you pr plug this into your uh, your inequality, your uh, herbs are your herbs inequality. This implies that so the expectation of the trace of g minus, so maybe I can go into state the pro, uh, this greater than delta is going to be smaller than exponential minus c delta square, uh, delta square, yeah, times g prime in it square. And this is true for any delta, so you can integrate it to get the any only moment. It's going to be smaller than G prime the 2K uh, over C to the K, and then I have uh, uh, the Gaussian moment. Okay, so so to conclude, uh, to get this uh, this bond, uh, you only need, as I said, to use this uh, this uh, this control, and then to proceed by approximation. Okay, I'm not going to do that, but you just approximate uh, your polynomial by a bounded continuous function. Okay, so you take g, which is uh, x to the uh, to the k. Uh, well, x to the l, and uh, on x smaller than 3 divided by square root of c, and then uh, smooth, and let's say going to 0 uh, afterwards. And you can deduce from here that you have a bond also on the trace of x to the l minus the expectation. And so this gives you this, uh, uh, this estimate by using uh, older inequality. 
All right, so, so let me uh, at least show you how to deduce from there the convergence. Well, yeah. Yeah. Here it was just because in brass complete you have to subtract the mean of each entries. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. You don't have yeah. Uh, I'll give you a hand a little bit. So, so you also get um, still. Um, the, the Dyson Schringer equation, and the idea is that somehow in your potential, you have more, much more confining uh, potential, and so you can show that by your, uh, your uh, Dyson Schringer equation, actually, this term is going to be bonded. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Also, you, you can see that uh, the expectation of this guy by, uh, by uh, rotation, by invariance, by uh, multiplication by unitary matrices is going to be diagonal. So, use it. so then it's uh, actually it's a constant time identity, and then uh, you can uh, realize that it's uh, the constant is never going to blow up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let me uh, show you uh, after all this technical thing how to use uh, this e inequality to prove at least convergence. And again, this convergence is only true in such a generality. I mean, it's only known in this kind of uh, perturbative setting, convergence. So here I will uh, forget about the extra terms. Okay, so I don't exist. Don't exist, and I don't exist. I'm sure I'm going to for regret I did that, but that's life. Okay, so, so on what you see that here, because you know the covariance is bonded, and here you divide by n, so if you divide by n, this is going to be approximately the sum over the product of the expectation. Okay, as before. So you see that now the, all these quantities, because of the compactness, are well bonded, so you know you can take limit points. And you get an equation for the limit points. So you have limit points. And so, so along subsequences, but you can see that this will converge towards some MK, uh, which, uh, yeah. And so if you look at the equation that the limit will satisfy, so I will have MK plus. So let me uh, expand Q prime, so it will be, uh, so it will be degree, so it will be a sum and some, uh, let, let me write that Q is a sum of alpha i x to the i. So then what I get is the i, uh, alpha i, where we'll have uh, m of Q minus one, uh, Q plus i minus two. This is coming from this term. So this will be uh, the sum of uh, L equals zero to K minus two of ML, M, K minus L minus two. Okay, and so the point now is to show that this has a unique solution, which is bonded. So the question is unique solution. And you, you know something more, so you know because it's trivial that M0 is one, M1 is zero. And you also know that a priori you had this bond, that this was smaller than this thing over there. And so uh, to prove uniqueness, so you know when, uh, that there is a unique solution when epsilon is zero, so it's really a perturbative argument. And the idea is just to assume that you have two solutions and show that it's impossible provided epsilon is small enough. And <clears throat> and to do that, 
you just get a closed equation. So, so you take two solutions first, M and M tilde, two solutions. And you take the difference. So, so you, you put delta MK, the difference MK minus M tilde K. And what you get is a delta of MK. So this is going to be bonded, so this I put it on the other side. So I will have epsilon, the sum I alpha I, and then I have delta of M. Well, actually, there is already an absolute value. K plus I minus 2. And then uh, I do the difference also here. So I will have M minus M tilde times M plus uh, M tilde times the difference. So I can bound these two by the sum M uh, delta M uh, L. And for the other one, I, uh, I just bound it by my a priori bond. So it will be 3 the square root of C, uh, K minus L minus 2. Okay. And now to show that there is a unique, actually there is no, a unique solution, I take a generating series. So I will take a delta uh, M. So let's take L of uh, delta, which is the sum of the delta K, delta M K. Okay, and then uh, what you see that so, so in, in the case k equal to zero on one, this, this is zero because the boundary condition are the same. And so what you get is L delta is smaller than, so epsilon sum I alpha I. So here I will, I, I multiply by delta to the k uh, plus I minus two and I divide by delta I minus two. Okay, and I sum over k. And uh, I forgot something, and delta m k plus i minus 2. And then when I have this thing, I, I also the sum inside, so I will have delta uh, to the l, delta m l. Then I have the sum over the 3 over square root of c uh, k minus uh, L minus 2 times delta K minus L minus 2. Then multiply by delta K, so I have still delta square. Okay, and uh, when you, if you do that carefully, so you should find that you have L delta, which is smaller than, so epsilon sum I alpha I delta I minus 2 times uh, L delta. So this is for the first term when I sum over K. And then uh, the other one, I will get a plus delta square. I have this sum, but which is converging provided delta is small enough. So I have 1 minus 3 over square root of C delta. And then I have uh, L, de uh, L delta. Okay, so you see that if uh, your epsilon is small enough so that you can find delta positive so that smaller than one, there exists a unique solution. Okay? And so what you have proved is the convergence at this point, so you have proved that so this, this is true, of course, if epsilon is small enough. So here also I use that L delta was finite by my a priori bond. And so what you conclude is that the expectation of 1 over n, the trace of x, n to the k. So this converge to uh, mk, which is solution of this equation, on which, I, which is a moment of some uh, function, of some probability measure. Okay, so that's that's the first uh, the first result. Uh, what you can check also is uh, that if you look at this uh, equation, 
it's also satisfied by this solution that I was telling you, this enumeration of maps. And so because you have a unique solution, again, uh, you can see that uh, this, uh, this limit will be given by this, uh, this uh, generating function for the enumeration of maps. And so I will not have the time to show you how to prove the next order today, but just in, uh, in one minute, and since I anyway started a bit late, I can show you how to deduce the convergence of the free energy from there. Okay. The convergence of the free energy. And uh, well, to do that, it's an old trick that if you look at the n v, so it's x squared plus epsilon q, okay, the, po the potential is this, and you divide by the n of x squared, the log, you can write that this is the integral of the derivative of this guy. Okay, and uh, when you dif do this is the differential, you have to remember that uh, this was your density, so an exponential minus n trace of q coming. So actually what you get is integral zero to epsilon, and the, the mean, so under the interpolated potential, so the potential is tq, of uh, one over n, the trace of q. So I think there is a minus. Okay, and now what you see that here you are in a good shape because this potential will satisfy all your hypotheses. I mean, it will be, it's a convex combination of x squared plus epsilon q on x squared. So it's still convex. T is even smaller. So now you can go to the limit and deduce that uh, you have this. So that's how you can prove a convergence. Of course, each time, and it can become more and more complicated when we get to more and more complicated models, it's not always easy to find actually a good interpolation. And also, here you are happy because you know this partition function. Uh, it's, it's well known, it's a Selberg formula. But in other cases, you don't know how to compute it. So for instance, in the analog problems, when you look at uh, in dimension two, uh, it's not known how to, to compute any of these partition functions. So in this case, uh, you, you cannot deduce from, from there an asymptotic formula for this kind of uh, model, uh, model with a potential, but in, in this case, it's possible. Okay. So, so next time, I will uh, show you how to deduce in the same uh, ideas uh, the second order, so the CLT and the second order, and also then I, I will go to uh, more complicated cases where we don't want to assume convexity. So where all these uh, a priori uh, tools that I showed you on um, uh, breast complete inequalities and, uh, and uh, Herb's argument are not available. Thank you, Steve. If you have questions.